Hello and welcome to the bestseller experiment where we continue to discover what makes a bestseller and inspire you to start, finish and publish your book. I'm Mark DeVoe. And I am Mark Stay. And a huge thank you as always to our patrons and academics in the Bestseller Academy who, thanks to their generosity and huge hearts, uh, keep this podcast going. And we have a new patron this week. Uh, everyone, budge up at the back, please, and make room for Mr. Richard Beasley. Richard, thank you for your support. Richard now has access to loads of deep dives and extra material and all sorts of exclusive fun stuff that, that makes it worth being a patron. So uh, thank you, Richard, and thank you to all of them. Brilliant stuff. And if you want to join Richard, then please pop on to bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash support to become a patron of this podcast. And if you are interested in coming and joining Mark and I on a very, very exciting webinar on the 8th of December. The Bestseller Academy are holding a webinar where you can come and meet us both. We want to have a chat where you can ask us questions and we'll tell you more about the Bestseller Academy and how it could help you make 2022 your very best writing year yet. So do come along and join us. Just pop along to academy.bestsellerexperiment.com and register for the webinar. Now, I will say, folks, there are only 100 spaces. We have a limited limited amount of space so if you want to be part of that you do have to register and you have to register quick because i think there's only about 40 spots left as we record this which is quite a long time before it actually comes out so that being said mr stay i it's been quite a year isn't it 2021 we're getting towards the end firstly i can't believe how quickly it's gone i know i say that every year but they do say life tends to speed up as you get older. It's a bit isn't it? Yeah. The great accelerator of life. Whoosh. What was that? Oh, Christmas again. I have yeah. a theory. I have a theory around that. I think it's because when we're kids and we have those long summer holidays that seem to go on forever, we have a lot of time to watch the clock. And yet when we get to our age, there's so much stuff going on. There's people to look after. There's books to write. There's dinners to cook. And you just don't have time to sit and look at the clock which is why it seems to go a lot quicker. But there is some science out there, apparently, that, that talks about this. I, I must delve it's into It's called it relativity. More. It's relativity. <laughs> yeah, and it's absolutely true. It, time is relative. And if you've met any of my relatives, you'll know that time stretches longer when they're around. Oh, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> oh, it's just a joke with Christmas coming up. But yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was listening. I was listening, actually. You know, funny enough, yesterday I was listening back to one of our Christmas specials with Sir Ian Rankin, as I like to call him. And it was, it was, it was brilliant. We were talking about, if you haven't heard it, if you want to get festive, we do have a Christmas special coming up. It was hilarious because we both got into a conversation about uh, Cards Against Humanity. And I literally, I was listening to it again yeah. yesterday. I haven't laughed so much. I mean, we <laughs> so... Just to give you a little preview, folks, we're going to do a Christmas special um, coming up in a few weeks, obviously, with Christmas around the corner. And we're going to be talking about some of our favorite books that we got for Christmas and some of our favorite Christmas books. So we want you to join in the conversation. So um, if you want to get in the festive spirit, if you're you know, warming up for Christmas, pop along to our Facebook and Twitter pages and tell us what your favorite Christmas book or book that you got for Christmas was. Um, and if you want, as a little bonus, because Mark and I like to have fun around this, tell us what your favourite kid's toy was as well. Yes. And we'll have a bit of a nostalgic reminisce. Absolutely. Looking forward to it. Can't yeah, wait. Absolutely. <laughs> now, before before we dive into all of the, uh, the, the, well, this incredible interview we've got today, anyone who missed last week's show or didn't stick with us to the end will have missed a little <laughs> thing that you just happened to slip in and as we're documenting the process of going towards your big movie release, Mark, in, uh, in uh, the new year, um, remind everyone who missed it, what, what's the date that the movie's coming out now? It's been announced and you can tell everyone, can't you? Well, it's easy to remember um, because it's St. Patrick's Day, March 17th. Um, well, that uh, technically, is that, if you look on IMDb, it says March 18th, but March 17th is when, if there's a premiere or whatever, previews or what have you, that, that's going to be the day. So we're going to be rolling out the green carpet. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Love it. Yeah, more, more details to follow, but it's great. And that's going to be UK and USA. Rest of the world, still not sure. Um, so hang in there. But um, yeah, so uh, looking forward to that. It's... Um, it's, 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 it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. Well, I hope, I hope everyone's excited as I am, Mark, because uh, I think there's only other one premiere of a movie that had a green, par a green carpet, and I think that was Shrek. So, uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm really, really, I'm really, I can't wait to see it. And um, 
it's super exciting. I mean, I do think it's incredible through COVID that this is all happening. Um, it's and, a little bit unreal, yeah, to be honest. It is a bit it's surreal, bit, isn't it? How yeah, are you? Okay, let's yeah. just check in because I know you, I know you don't really want to talk about this, but how are you? How are you feeling? How are you feeling right now? A few months before, is it nerve wracking? Is it exciting? Is it still completely surreal? It's it's still a bit surreal because it's so over there on the horizon. You know, it's it's um, but if it. You know, Warner Brothers, certainly in the UK, are giving it a really good release, uh, which Robot Overlords did not get. So John and I have been saying things like, oh, bloody hell, people are actually going to see this one. <laughs> so, so there's a there's a slightly, um, you know, scary thing there. But, you know, it's all, it's all part of the fun, it you know, getting to people's be, reactions right? to it. You know, not, you know, you, I, I just can't wait to hear what people think of it. And there are, if you're a podcast listener, and you know all the tropes of the podcast and all the little catchphrases and the things that we talk about. There's quite a bit in there for you. So, uh, you know, I think, really? I, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh. There's, 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 a, there's a couple of little references in there that if you listen to the podcast, you'll go, oh, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Brilliant. Little, Same little Easter eggs. Well, yeah, it's yeah. very similar to what we did in Back to Reality as well. Oh, there's, yeah. a, there's a lot yeah, of references. Yeah. If you haven't read Back to Reality, actually, um, we should we should well before we forget, we should mention that we are doing a pledge for the hardback book. If you would like to get um, one of the hardback books, what we're doing is we're taking pledges up front, a bit like a Kickstarter, and once we hit a hundred, we're going to actually print the hardback. So if you'd like to be a part of that, we will put your name in the back of the book. Yeah, and we'll also add in. We're going to add in a a little bonus for readers at the back, which will be the, um, the kind of miss it. Well, the, what is it? The original first chapter? It's the, the, chapter it's the original opening. Uh, so it's like the, the, the prologue and the first chapter, which has also has all our little notes of, uh, like a director's commentary a director's from you commentary, and me yeah. saying, we changed this, we changed that. We had an argument over that. We, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like exactly. Stuff. So, do, you, yeah, yeah. do you know what I think is interesting as well? I mean, don't think of this, if you've already got the book and if you've read it, well, thank you so much for buying and, and, you know, getting it to number one, like it went when we, when we first put it out. But think of this as the textbook for the bestseller experiment <laughs> podcast. It's like, it's the study notes, isn't it? In some ways. And it shows you the kind of, you know, what went through our heads, why we cut the first section, but you know, you can read, read the first section and see why it didn't make it, but also see what was going on in our minds that, you know, well, and it was really much a kind of a warm up into the book. So it's I, a, it's a little insight into the creative process. Absolutely. So think of it as a, think of it as your bestseller experiment workbook. Um, and, and you can read it alongside the paperback if you've got that as well. So, um, if you'd like to pledge for the hardback, you simply go along to, uh, Back to, uh, no, it's bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash back to reality. And if you can't wait, if you can't wait for the the, the hardback and you haven't read it, um, well, you can buy the paperback now and you can also buy the audio book. And on that note, Mr. Stay, we have an announcement to make, don't we? (laughs) (laughs) We do. Yes, we we we've uh, we did a little giveaway um, to get uh, copies of our audio book. If you sign up to our newsletter, and thank you to everyone who signed up and everyone who has entered. And uh, we have the name. Should we announce them at the end? Yeah, let's keep them on the hook. Yeah, right? that's what they teach that. us in yeah. writing. Yeah. <laughs> so if you want to find school. out if you've won, <laughs> if you want to, yeah, exactly. If you want to, we've been doing this too long there, Mark, haven't we? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> If you want to find out if you've won, stick with us until the end of the episode. Excellent stuff. Now, Mr. Stay, we have a wonderful guest. What a story this is. Unbelievable. Tell us about the lovely Lisa Hall. Oh, such a delight to speak to Lisa. Lisa Hall is the best-selling author of Tell Me No Lies, The Party, Have You Seen Her? And her debut novel, Between You and Me, was awarded the Nielsen Award for selling over a quarter of a million copies. Her new novel, The Woman in the Woods, is a gothic thriller about a new mum who's moved into the house from hell and is set against the fascinating legends of Pluckley Village in Kent, which is about an hour away from me and is the most haunted village in England. Fact fans. And this, so this is a supernatural chiller. It's a bit different from my usual stuff. It's dark, disturbing, disturbing, and absolutely fascinating. So we discuss how blogging led to writing novels, how rejection can be like a dagger to the heart, and why she wanted to burn one of her books. 
<laughs> Brilliant stuff. So let's listen in, folks. Get yourself a nice cup of tea or coffee, a glass of water or something stronger, and have a listen to Mark chatting with the lovely Lisa Hall. Lisa Hall, welcome to the bestseller experiment. How are you today? I'm good. Thank you for having me. It's our absolute pleasure. And folks, this is an audio interview, but because we do have a YouTube channel as well. If you tune into our YouTube channel, you'll see behind Lisa, we love stuff like this. We love seeing inside writers' rooms and you'll see there are post-it notes and postcards on a board behind you on a whiteboard. Is that is that your current work in progress? Is that is that uh, the next epic coming into, into shape behind you? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. That's what I'm working on at the moment. Um, hopefully it's whipping it into shape, but you know how it is. Like, you can never guarantee that what's on the board ends up on the page. So <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. Very, very true. Well, look, let's talk about what is on the page. Wow. The Woman in the Woods, fantastic gothic thriller. And this is, I think, I'm, I'm all right in thinking, this is the first time that one of your stories has had a supernatural element to it. Yeah, that's right. I've never, I've never done it before, and I was actually quite scared—not of the ghosts, but <laughs> I was scared of writing something that was com- not completely different, but very, very different to what I've done before. But it's been received quite well, so hopefully, people are enjoying it. Lovely. Tell us the premise. What's what's it all about? Um, well, it's um, it's the story of Ali and Rav. Um, they move to uh, their what's supposed to be their dream home in uh, a village in Kent called Pluckley, which is a real place. Mm. Um, and it's 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 got a history as being known as the most one of the most haunted villages in England. So there's that. But it's their dream home, and they've they've got a, a young family. They've got a new baby, and it's not long before Ali starts to find that things aren't quite right in the house. Um, but she's not sure if someone's messing with her mind or if there is something a little bit more sinister going on. And when she finds out that there is a legend attached to their house, that their house was once known as the witch house, um, Hmm. then things really do ramp up and she she really has a bit of a bad time. (laughs) The witch house, it's not the sort of thing they put on right move, is it? No, no. (laughs) No one mentioned that to Ali and Rav when they were looking on right move. This state agent has been worse. What I, what I love about the opening as well is you really capture that delirium of waking up at four in the morning with a new baby screaming its head off and the fact that you don't know up from down or left from right. Is, was that was that particularly easy to write or was it quite difficult? Very easy. Three times I did it. <laughs> <laughs> and eight kids seem to get worse. No, they're good kids. Um, yeah, I think every, every mum and dad can relate to some extent to that whole when you bring this tiny creature home and I don't know about other people, but I kind of only thought as far as sort of like going into labor, I never thought about what I'd have to do when I had to bring the baby home. Um, So I think everyone kind of has some experience. Everyone who has a child has some experience of that um, confusion and delirium and the, the whole sense that your life has been turned upside down. It's the it's the lovely little resentments as well. It's like Rav comes in, finds her on the kitchen floor, and doesn't even offer to make her a cup of tea. It's very, it was all very relatable, I think. I'm not saying whether that's real life or not. <laughs> uh, as you say, it's set in a real place, Pluckley, which is the most haunted village in England. Um, did you have to invent or change much? I remember we had Julie Wasmer on the podcast uh, a while back and she writes about Whitstable brilliantly in her books, but she's had to, I think she changed the name of a church. She's changed the names of a couple of shops because, you know, obviously real proprietors don't want murders happening on their doorstep necessarily. What did you What did you bring to Pluckley and is, is, did you have to invent or change anything? Um, I changed a few things. I kept the pub because the pub is quite a focal point in the village and in the book. Um, and the landlady there is actually really nice and she didn't mind that I put her in a book. <laughs> and she told me lots of stories about what really goes on in that pub. Um, lots of ghost stories. Uh, but I did I did change a couple of things, but it was more for my convenience. That I gave them a co-op. They don't have a co-op, but in my book, they have a co-op. <laughs> Just because that was what worked for me. So, so I changed a few things, but nothing really... I think really too drastic. Right, right. Um, as we said, there is a supernatural element to this. What were the big challenges there, seeing as it's the first time you've 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 had to sort of bring that into one of your stories? 
Um, I think the challenge was keeping it keeping it believable, um, but still including that supernatural element. So it was quite difficult. I didn't want it to to be like some real sort of shock horror terrible horror story you know like one of these b-movie type things I I wanted it to still be more psychological rather than you know slasher um so it was it was kind of researching other people's experience with the supernatural and trying to bring that into it to keep it still sort of relatable and believable Excellent stuff. I read somewhere that your writing always starts with a, a what if question and goes from there. Was that the case with with the the woman in the woods as well? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, at the time, my son. I mean, he's a, he's a teenager. He was he was working at McDonald's, and the idea came to me because I I was nipping out to pick him up. He finished his shift at like nine in the evening and it was this this time of year. So it was dark outside and I've got two other children, but they're also, they're not, they're not little babies or anything. Um, and I had left them at home while I went to pick him up and I didn't lock the front door. And I thought, what if I get back and something has happened to the children? Because that's how my mind works. Apparently, not everybody's mind works that way. <laughs> <laughs> Mine does too, don't worry. You're not yeah. alone. <laughs> so, and then it kind of stemmed from that. And it was like, what if this woman knew that something bad was going to happen? She knew that her children were in danger, but she didn't know how or why. And then it was a case of taking that question and going back and looking at how I was going to make the story work. Okay. What's your... Let's talk about your your method. Are you a big outliner, or or are you pantsing it as you go along? Uh, <laughs> very true. Yes, uh, for audio listeners, Lisa has just gestured, as I should have realised, uh, to the uh, the board behind her with all the cards outlining the story. So that that that's what works for you. I'm a severe plotter. A severe plotter. I like. Uh, I, I I start with bullet points of of scenes that I know need to happen in the book. Um, so that gives me a rough beginning, middle, and end. Then I work on my post-its and every post-it has what's going to happen in that chapter, but briefly. So then the brief post-its then get transferred into the notebook. Nice. Lovely. Handwritten notebook. A better chapter plan. Um, (laughs) And then, then I finally sit down to write the chapter. So I don't know if it's that I really need to plot and I really need to know exactly what's going to happen when I sit down or if I'm just really good at procrastinating and dragging things out. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. Now, let's talk about how it all started for you because, as I understand it, your debut novel, Between You and Me, was the first thing you'd written since school. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. But... Uh, up to that point, you had been a book blogger, a, you know, a voracious reader, reading and reviewing books. Did that inspire you to write? Did that inform your writing? Um, I don't know that it inspired me um, because I all, all I always knew that I wanted to do it, but I think it gave me the confidence to actually write because it's very difficult, I think, when when you start writing or if you haven't written for a long time I think it's really difficult to have the courage to show your work to other people Mm. and it almost feels like the blogging was a stepping stone because once I started blogging obviously people written I'm not saying thousands of people read my reviews but other people that weren't my mum or my husband (laughs) read my reviews and then that gave me the confidence and at the same time I started an open university course and um that helped as well with the confidence, you know, writing things that you then have to show to other people and get feedback. Um, so yeah, I would say I would say it was it it was definitely a stepping stone. It was definitely something that gave me the courage to to actually start writing properly. Was the OU course um, a creative writing course? I, I did uh, the English literature and creative writing degree. Um, which was such hard work, especially once I did get published. I shouldn't complain at all because I wouldn't have ever <laughs> written a book if I hadn't done that, if I hadn't started that course. It was such hard work, but it was it was very, very helpful, and that definitely helped develop my writing, definitely. Did you have to complete a novel as part of the course? How, how did that work? Uh, well, uh, for, my final, for my final piece, 
I we we obviously didn't have to do we didn't have to do a whole novel, but we had to to hand in a, a, a I think it was a five thousand word piece, and right. you could use the opening of a novel, which I did do, but I I only I only finished this summer. I graduated this summer, so the piece that I handed in, I did get a very good mark for it, and that's in the pipeline. My agent's seen it. I have written the rest of the book. My agent's seen it, and she <laughs> likes it. So hopefully, that will that will something will happen with that, that later on. <laughs> okay, so you you were published before you finished your OU. Co- oh wow! Oh, that's brilliant. Okay, well, yeah. look, tell us about tell us about between you and me then your debut, how that how that came about, and what what inspired you to to start work on that. Um, well, I had I had this I had this what if question, mm-hmm. which I kind of I can't really tell you the what if question it's because a twist, if people isn't haven't there? read it, yeah, it's a stonking spoiler. So, <laughs> and I kept saying, what if? What if you thought this? What if this happened? And in the end, he was like, I really think you just need to sit down and write it. So we went. We we were away. We were in the US in in LA in a in a bar that served these gigantic gigantic margaritas <laughs> with shots of Jack Daniels in. And I basically hashed out the whole plot with him and he was like, go away and write it now. So then once I wasn't drunk anymore, <laughs> I kind of realised, oh, I was going to do that. So I did, I wrote it and I wrote it. I was working full time and I was I was doing my OU course. Um, so I'd get up at like five in the morning and write for an hour before the kids got up and I just squeezed it in wherever I could um, and then I was really fortunate. I was really fortunate. I was reading. Um, I was reading the book on my Kindle, and at the very end of the book, it was a, a HQ book, or before HQ became HQ, Karina. Mm-hmm. Um, and at the very end of the book, it said, "We have open submissions. We want to see your work. Submit to us." So I did, and I didn't think anything would happen. I did. I did submit to a few other places as well. Um, and I did submit to a few agents and I got some quite brutal rejections. Um, and then um, the lady who would become my first editor, she she emailed me and she said, I'd like to see the rest of the book. So I sent it to her. And then about a week later, she rang me and she was like, we really, we really like the book and we'd like to offer you a two book deal. So I really did get drunk that night. <laughs> Wow, there's so much to unpack there. So you were, you know, you've got a family, you're doing an OU course, you're working full time, but you remember you remember the 5 a.m. writers club. We see that hashtag yeah. quite a bit on Twitter. So how long were you writing for and what sort of word count were you getting every day? I was aiming for 2,000 words a day. Wow. So I think the planning helped because I knew when I sat down to write, because the time was so precious, when I sat sat down I knew exactly what I was going to write in that that I knew what that chapter was about I knew what had to happen so that did help but obviously you can't get 2,000 words done in the hour hour and a half before the kids get up so it was a case of a bit in the morning then maybe a little bit on my lunch break and then a bit in the evening so it took me I'd say it took me about four months for for a first draft but it was seven days a week yeah hard slog yeah 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 what what did you do with that first draft once it was once it was done? Um, I showed it to my husband, and he said, "I think you've got something here." Um, but you know what it's like when your mum reads it, or your your <laughs> husband or your wife. You kind of think, "Oh yeah, okay, you kind of have to say that." He doesn't anymore. He's like, "No, that doesn't work." No, take that bit out. <laughs> um, and then I, I kind of left it for a couple of weeks and went back and polished it up and. And then I, I I showed a friend and she said, no, I really, I really do think you have got something here. And I thought, oh, okay, that's two people. So maybe I do. And then I sent it to, um, to a friend who was, a, who's a book blogger and she, she read it and she said, I think, I think you might have something. I thought, right, okay. Okay. I think, I think I might. And that's what I then sort of sent it out and, spent hours over my query letter and all the rest of it. Right. <laughs> Tell us, if you can, about those brutal rejections and how you dust yourself off after something like that. Cried a lot. <laughs> oh. Cried a lot. Um, but you kind of, I, I think I've got a bit of a thicker skin now, you know, but at the time it was like, 
a dagger in my heart, honestly. Um, and most of them were nice. Most of them were really nice. I'd spoken to, I'd been to Harrogate to the to the crime festival that year and I'd spoken to an editor there and she said well send it to me when you when you're done and she did reject me but she gave me the loveliest rejection she just said look because because of the I think because of the twist and because it's not it wasn't sort of your average crime thriller book it was more sort of domestic noir she didn't really know where to place it but I did have a really awful one from this guy um, and he just wrote across my own query letter, I don't think so, and posted oh. it back to me. What? Oh, my God. And now, I really wish that when Between You and Me went to number one on Amazon, <laughs> I really wish I could <laughs> shot, printed it and posted it to him. But apparently that's petty to do things like that. <laughs> <laughs> but incredibly satisfying. How rude. How mm. rude. Well, I mean, you can only take solace from the fact that you clearly dodged a bullet there. That's not someone you want to work with, is it? I mean, it's, No, uh, absolutely yeah. not. I've got the most amazing agent now, and I just I couldn't be without her. She's amazing. Wow. Wow. Crikey! Okay, so uh, tell us about that moment when, uh, uh, when between you and me, you got that positive response uh, from HQ, and where it, where it went from there. It was a bit. It felt a little bit like it wasn't really happening to me, <laughs> and I feel like that whole. That was in the October that they said they 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 wanted to publish it, and then they announced it about a month later, and I hadn't told anyone. Obviously, my husband knew, but I hadn't told anyone right. else. Right. So all my friends and my family found out at the same time, and my phone just blew up. <laughs> um, and then it was it was quite a learning curve because you don't realise, do you? When you when you write your first book before you get signed, you just think, "Wow, I've written a book," and they, no one actually tells you. Right, okay, so you've written a book, but you've only written the first draft. So uh, now the hard work's really going to start, and that was quite a quite a learning curve to see the whole process of, of you know structural edits line edits copy edits you know discussions about the cover and things like that none of that it was a bit like you know like I said I thought as far as the labor but I hadn't thought about bringing the child home <laughs> and it was the same thing <laughs> what were the what were the biggest surprises about the process was there anything you really hadn't expected to cope with um I think the biggest surprise really was the response that I got to the book when it came out because I, I didn't really expect it was so so successful and so people were talking about it and I was getting emails sort of every day I was having emails from people um and that was really weird the thought that there's people there's people on the other side of the world that are reading something that I wrote at five o'clock in the morning <laughs> <laughs> and that, that I still can't quite get my head around that. And then and then let's um let's not you know let's not be coy about this. You were you got a Nielsen award and listeners Nielsen are the people who collate book sales in uh, in the UK and across the world. You got a Nielsen award for selling over a quarter of a million copies of Between You and Me. That must I mean that doesn't happen to everyone. I can tell you that that must have been a pinch me moment. What, what was that like? It was amazing. I just, like I said, it just feels like it felt like it wasn't happening to me. It wasn't happening to me. And we've got it, we've got it up on our kitchen wall so I can look at it every day and remind myself it did actually happen. It did actually happen. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, after that, so I mean, you got between you and me. Tell me no lies. The party. Have you seen of the perfect couple? What was that? What was that second book like? We talk about that second difficult album. That second difficult book. Was that having? What were the lessons you you had learned with the first book that you took forward to the second book? Well, it kind of it it happened really quickly because I'd written this first book and I wasn't really expecting to get published, and then it did get published, and then they were like, "Well, we need another book," and I was like, "Okay." And I kind of had a vague idea of what I wanted to do. And when I look back, I wish I had asked them for more time because I don't feel, out of all my books, I don't feel that my second book is my strongest by any means. And I kind of wish if I had my time again, I would go back and say to them, you know, I do need a little bit more time. I need I need to, to, to develop the characters a little bit more um, and to, 
just spend a little bit more time polishing it up because I don't feel that it was my best work. But I would say the third book was worse. <laughs> really, really. <laughs> the third book, The Party, is not the original third book. Right. The third book is In a Drawer, Never to Be Seen Again. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I worked, I worked really hard on it and I really loved the, the premise of it and my agent loved it and the editor said she loved it um, and we went backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards on, on structural edits, but it was backwards and forwards. Back, right. No, this still isn't right. This still isn't right. And it was almost like none of us could kind of put our finger on what was not working in the book. Mm-hmm. So my editor then left she said, um, I was going on holiday and she said, I'll send you your copy edits before you go. And I thought, thank God, copy edits, no more structure edits. And then she didn't. And I went on holiday and I got an email to say, oh, by the way, I'm leaving. And I was like, but what about my book? Um, so then I got a new editor who's my editor now and she's amazing. And, and I met her and we had a drink and she said, what do you want to do with this book? And I said, honestly, I just want to burn it because it's not working and I can't figure out why it's not working. And she said, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I want to write a book about a woman who wakes up after a party and she knows something's happened to her, but she's got no memory of the night before. And she was like, okay, write that book. So that's how the party came to be the third book. But in between, there's a really, really dodgy book that does really need to go on the bonfire. (laughs) <laughs> well, yeah, listeners, we're recording this on the 5th of November, so perhaps uh, tonight's the night. Um, brilliant. Oh, it's so interesting to hear that. Uh, what's coming next uh, for you? I mean, it's, obviously, it's on the board behind you there, and we don't want to, don't want any spoilers, but uh, what's, what's coming up next for you after The Woman in the Woods? Uh, well, I'm working on something now about a woman who uh, – she grows up on a, small, on a small island just off the south coast of Ireland – And when she's 17, she does something pretty bad and she leaves. And now 15 years later, her mother has died. She gets called to say that her mother's dying and she has to go back. Um, And she's she's a writer and she's writing a true crime book about women and, and violence against women and how the public can play a part in sometimes resolving cases. Anyway, she goes back to the island and and a girl has disappeared from the island. She's gone missing and everyone kind of thinks she's a runaway, but our girl has has a suspicion that something's not quite right. So even though she's going to put a cat amongst the pigeons because of what she did before, she's going to try and get to the bottom of it. Brilliant. Sounds fantastic. Well, until then, folks, you've got The Woman in the Woods, which is out now. So go grab your copy. And Lisa, thank you so much for speaking to us. Really enjoyed it and hope to speak to you again soon. Thank you so much for having me. What are your writing dreams? Finishing that book, quitting the day job, becoming a best-selling author? Well, over four years, we've studied the advice of over 300 best-selling authors who've collectively sold over half a billion books. And we are excited to announce the Best Seller Academy. If you're ready to take your writing to the next level with accountability, craft and coaching, your bestseller dreams are now only a click away. To find out more and apply, visit bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash academy that's bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash academy oh what a great story that was what a great story but let's just start where we have we have to start with the letter from the agent i cannot believe a knob frankly (laughs) i mean what what an unprofessional! Why? Uh, yeah, why? why? Why would you do that? Why would you do that to anyone? And they do say the best revenge is success. So Lisa's, you know, Lisa's well, got to put. Well, I that. think. Do you know? You, and you're right. And I think that 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 letter should be framed and put in <laughs> Lisa's writing room, um, and and to look at that. Every every day when she she you know reads her royalty statements and, uh, and I, I, I but I do think okay let, let's just talk about why that would happen I mean I often think I often think that if I'm driving out on the street 
and someone gives me the bird or the finger because they're having a bad day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's two ways you respond. You either get very upset and, and outraged, or, how dare you? Or you think, blimey, what's going on in their life? And yeah. I do wonder that, you know, someone's obviously having a bad day. But at the end of the day, there's no, there's no need for that because it's wasted energy on everyone absolutely mm. wastes energy if i've been through this a lot with music and i think we all go through it with books books i think a bit different because you know people might start a book and give up after a first page or two if it's not their thing and then and then give it a one star review which i don't think is fair either i think you know read the whole thing and then make a judgment on it yeah, but with yeah. music music's really interesting because it's like a three minutes three and a half minutes and, and people can make their opinion on it very quickly and i did go through that early days of my career in music it was it was brutal like you'd get tons of amazing reviews and then you'd get that one absolute like <laughs> stinger and you think, why did you waste your ink? Like, why didn't you put a review in the newspaper or the, or the, or the magazine of something you liked instead of writing about something you didn't like because it's completely wasted energy. So um, yeah, it, it doesn't, people, there are, there's a certain level of people on review, you know, good reason, Amazon, things like that, mm. who don't really know what review reviews aren't for us. Let's be honest. They're not for the creators. They're for people coming along who want to know if this is worth reading. And if you give a review that's constructive, you say, well, uh, this is the author's intent. I don't think they succeeded. The book kind of falls short because of that. That's a fair review saying, oh, this is rubbish because of X, you know, for, in a completely unconstructive way doesn't help anyone it's just venting yeah and it's you know i we it would be nice if more people knew how to actually so you know leave a review and write a review and um, when i get a review where someone has you know understood a theme or an idea that i was going after that really means something to me you know that mm. really means they've paid attention uh and um and given it some thought whereas something like i don't think so doesn't really do well, that does, at that all. Doesn't doesn't help anyone. I mean, it doesn't even it doesn't explain why. You know, I think I think it's absolutely you know fine to say I, it's not for me, because yes. you know I, again within yes. it's very again it's easy within music to have this distinction. Like when when somebody. I coach a lot of people who, you know, and, and and we need to talk about this in more detail. We talk about this a lot, actually, on the Academy, this kind of criticism that people firstly fear. And if they do, you know, put their head above a parapet, are brave enough to get feedback on their work or even put mm -hmm. their work out on Amazon, which a lot of people don't because of the fear of, yeah. of the feedback. It's a huge thing. And I know a lot of people nodding their heads, mm -hmm. listening to this right now going, yeah, that's me. Well, if it is you, it's really important to realize that there are ways to combat these kind of levels of criticism. And, and I always put it down to bad day or bad taste. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. the way I always justify it. What I found with, my, with the music is I would always say, if somebody doesn't like my music, you know, if they didn't like electronica chill out music, which is what I would write in, they probably like something like death metal. And that's absolutely fine. I mean, I death metal is not my thing, but everyone's allowed to have their own favourites. Yep. So it's it's more about it. It's rather than it's it's rubbish. It's like it's not for me. It should always be it's not for me. And the idea of bad taste, I love. This is like if somebody doesn't like your work, feel sorry for them that they don't have good taste in your, in your genre. <laughs> <laughs> that way, you push it all back onto them and it's all their loss and it's all their upbringing and it's got nothing to do with you. And that actually is a really powerful way to kind of just let this stuff wash over you, which we need to enla enable them on. You know about this. I mean, you've been through the ringer for many years with, with you know, putting things out. Um, it's about creating tools that let it wash, like water off a duck's back, right? I mean, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Writers, gather around. Come closer. Come closer. Here's here's the thing. We all write rubbish now and then. We all write something that's not good enough. Um, uh, but, you know, so you're not alone there, but we learn and we move on from it. But something like I don't think so doesn't help at all it it's it's it doesn't build it, it doesn't help you get back on and and learn and and do something new and more constructive it just makes me think you ever see that movie kelly's heroes uh one of my favorite war movies uh where donald sutherland's the kind of the hippie tank driver and he's just like what's with the negative waves moriarty he's you know what is the negativity doesn't you know help anyone you know if if um so yeah it's it gives me the, you know, we were talking about the film earlier and 
uh, there are some reviews. Like I love Empire Magazine. If Empire Magazine gives it a good review, that means something to me. If they give it a stinker, that will mean something to me. I mean, I'll stop my subscription. Um, <laughs> You've been warned. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, that there are certain reviewers that you think, oh, I hope, I hope they like it. Um, Kim Newman's another one, you know. So uh, it's um, and if they don't, it sort of breaks your heart a little bit um, because you know there's there's a kind of connection there. But uh, I, I know that if they don't like it, they're not going to say, "Well, I don't think so." They're going to make it constructive and pick out all my faults. In some ways, actually, that might even be worse. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's not, no, and, and, yeah. But but the crazy you know, thing I, is, I can learn phone, from that. You can, but on that front, it's still one individual within a within one publication, yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's the that's actually the crazy lottery of all of this. You know, it, it you know you might get a review in the Guardian, or you might get you know a review in whatever it might be, but it's still a human being. And it, it if you happen to get the right person, then you could get five stars. If you get the person that doesn't connect with it, and this goes for anyone's book as well. You know, um, you know in the New York Times, the person reviewing your book, if they love it because it's their thing. So it always comes down to an individual and their opinion. And you, we can still always say, well, it just wasn't for them. Um, mm. it, you know, it didn't, it didn't, didn't click with them for whatever reason, but it might on the other side of things might have been, might have been incredibly um, welcomed by someone else. So it is an interesting thing, but I think anyone out there doing this, and I say this out loud, Mark, you know, you know, knowing obviously your movie's coming out, but anyone out there doing this deserves a medal just for be just for doing it because it requires courage and a thick skin. And the only way you get that thick skin is by is by playing the guitar and building the calluses. And it hurts at first. Mm. Yeah. And the irony is is you have to keep playing the guitar to keep the calluses hard. Whereas if you don't if you stop playing, then your fingers get all like yeah. putty again and it That's starts to hurt very again. Good so, analogy. Very right. good analogy. Yeah. So yeah. it's you yeah. know anyone who's ever played the guitar know exactly what I mean. So, you know, have you got your calluses yet? to all the readers out there and writers that are thinking about, you know, putting something out there, you have to go through it. There's a little bit of pain to begin with, but once you've got the calluses, you, you move on. But what else does calluses give you? It makes you a better guitar player, right? You don't get those mm. buzzy sounds anymore because you've got nice, strong yeah. fingertips. It's interesting, yep. isn't no, it? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Let's talk about um, another thing that Lisa mentioned, which was about this idea of knowing when a book needs to die. Now, this one, when I heard that, I was thinking, wow. Yeah. That's an interesting very, one. This, this, is, this is one of the things, you know, we've talked about that second difficult book. Uh, I don't think we've ever done the third difficult book before. Uh, yeah, does it get so, easier? Is the third book easier than the second? It did. Or are they all as I mean, hard as each other? I mean, I'm writing a series at the moment, uh, and I'm editing the third book at the moment, and I'm loving it. And a lot of the groundwork is done. You know, the world is built. I know, I know the main characters really well, and I'm. It's just fun playing with them. And 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 whereas with Lisa, these are new characters, new situations each time. She's reinventing, well, inventing a world each time she she starts one of these. And I think it's something we don't talk about enough as authors because it's certainly for a lot of people listening to this the dream is to get published to get the first book out there and whoosh you know that's 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 the dream uh, but then there's the next book and the next book and the next book and then there will be books that don't work at all and it's it's unusual because the editor is there to help is there to sort of chivy things along and be you know your cheerleader but of course she had a situation where the editor her regular editor left which in some ways might have been a good thing because this new editor said, look, this is a clean break. Maybe mm. we could, you know, do something completely new. And it, it takes a very brave person to write off all of those hours of work. But as we said before, no writing is wasted. I'm sure Lisa, you know, would have learned a lot from the book that didn't work. You know, we learn as much from our failures as we do, probably more from our failures than we do, we, than we do our successes. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, it's very true. I think I do wonder how much of the challenges with the editor resulted in that book not wanting to be, you know, ever put out there. Because I think if you if you have a bad experience around the book, and it might not be just the writing, it might be something like you know, like somebody important leaving or never getting it to the point where it was it was kind of at, you know, where everyone was saying, yeah, this is really now working. Um, 
it's some. I think that's probably more why Lisa might have left it because of what happened. And I mean, I don't know. Would you would you recommend? Because I know in the past, I know in the past we talked to authors who said, you know, finish everything, you know, just get to the end because you just never know. But you know, at what point? When do you when do you allow you know an author to say, okay, this one, this is just this is just my warm up for the, the best if it's book I'm if it's making you unhappy. You know, there's a difference between something being difficult and challenging and something that is making you... If you sit down and you feel sick every time you sit down right, to write Right, like anxiety and, had, and stress around it, right? And I've had this. I had this. When I was starting out as a screenwriter, um, uh, and it was a lovely producer. It wasn't the producer's fault. This is entirely my fault. But um, they had an idea for a movie, and it wasn't my usual genre, it wasn't my usual thing, but I was so young and desperate. I said, yeah, I'll write that. There's no money in it, idiot. <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to get, you know, I thought, and this was somebody who got stuff made. So I thought, yeah, yeah, I'll do it. I'll, that's a great idea. I'll write it. And what followed was two years of abject misery. You know, I did a first draft, which I quite liked, but it wasn't what they wanted um so you know the conversations went back and forth can you make it more like this and i said no i want to make it i quite like this idea no it needs mm. to be like this if i'm going to mm. sell it and so yeah you you're both pulling in different directions and um but still i was young thought i'd get credit thought you know it could get made blah 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 so i hung in there but i it was one of these projects where every time i sat down to you know i did other things while this was going on yeah as is my want um, but every time I sat down to do this, it, it just made me feel, oh, here we go. And I should have pulled the plug after about six months, but I stuck with it for about two years. And in the end, I sat down uh, with them and we had a full and frank conversation where I said, yeah, this isn't working. Um, give it to another writer, completely rethink it, tear it up, walk away, whatever you want to do. The idea, because the producer came up with the idea. The idea is still yours. You run with it, go with it. I'm washing my hands of it. Thank you very much. Good night. Um, film's never been made, funnily enough. Mm. Although, weirdly, a completely different film with the same premise and title was made in Hollywood. Um, <laughs> right. I, yeah. But uh, it's, uh, you know, so having been through that experience once was a very difficult way of learning that uh, if it's making you unhappy, recognize that that line between challenging which is what every book is for me and every script is. There's a challenge, there's a new thing to try and overcome, and that's great and I love that, and being made miserable by it. And if it's making you depressed and it's making you miserable and it's turning you off writing, then you know what, put it away, start something else, take a break, start something else. Yeah, I, get, I think that's really good advice, Mark, because I think, and and also, but it's it's hard, it is that, it's a very fine line, I think, between when something becomes challenging and it's like, I mean, climbing Everest is challenging, and the trouble is, is when if you if you don't know how close you are to the breakthrough, you might turn around and traipse back down Everest. I always use this analogy of Everest being covered in um, clouds, the tip of it, so you don't actually know exactly how much further you've got before you get to the top. When it gets starts to get easier in terms of the descent, and so people have to be really have to really call this one. Um, I think as well, I think another good test is if you do take a break from something for, you know, a little bit of time, mm. how enthused do you feel about coming back to it later? Yeah. That's yeah. a good test, right? Because I found with the best ideas I've had, they always tend to stick around and they always keep calling my name and saying, Oi, you're ignoring me. Come and come and work on me a bit. And and the ones that never go, I think, are the the ones that are meant to be and they're probably the the, the main projects there's something to be said as well for people like i mean i know this is probably bad advice but i'll say it anyway you know <laughs> if you've got three four different ideas for book, book ideas which most of us do in fact you know some many more like write the first chapter of each one and see which one really draws you because mm. that way you've got a little bit of a play playoff between that is good, ideas. That is good advice actually or at least yeah. start making notes on them, see which one, you know, where, which one starts flowing. Because the one that you're most passionate about, this is my sense, the one that you're most passionate about is the one you're most likely to write the best story about and the one you're most likely to get to the end at. I mean, I'm writing this, I'm writing a, a novel right now, which 
but it's gone out the gates flying. I'm so excited about it. And I've hit a few brick walls this week with it. And I was mm -hmm. like, oh crap, you know, I, I forgot this bit. But yep. <laughs> I'm still excited about it. I'm still sitting there every night with my board plotting and trying to work out what happens next. And it's, 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 still, it's still got that momentum. And, you know, as long as the words keep flowing, you make, you're getting closer to that. To that L uh, losing losing momentum can be a killer. It can, which is why we talk about the 200 words a day thing. Even if you only write a wee, a little bit yeah. every day, then it keeps that momentum going. I mean, I've, um, I'm working on two projects at the moment. One is the book I'm editing and one is this new script idea. And, um, you know, I had an hour long phone call with the director today and made some notes and it was just a page of notes, I, probably not even 150 words, but I did. I did my work on that project today by having that conversation, you know, and I'm ready to write those notes up into something more sensible tomorrow. Um, but yeah, losing momentum is the killer. And the longer you leave it, and I recognize this myself, the longer you leave it, the more difficult that returning to it can be. Yeah. Uh, and I think part of the secret of keeping your joy in a project is to keep at it as often as you can. And it, it doesn't have to be, you know, writing 1,600, 2,000 words a day, 3,000 words a day. It can just be those 200 words, you know, a little spark of an idea. Just keep coming at it, keep coming at it, keep coming at it. Um, but if you if you give yourself a week off and you come back to it and you've got to get that boulder rolling again, it can be really, really, really hard. Yeah. Um, yeah. One other thing I love that Lisa said is she, she sent off her book whilst she was doing a course. Mm. So she started to sow the seeds and was getting practice at, you know, pitching her book and getting rejected. You know, those types of things are super important. And, and we know we know from all the people we're coaching in the academy that a lot of people are going through that process, even in even in their first year in the academy. They're they're reaching out for agents they're they're getting their feedback you know from fellow academates and the like and i think there's something to be said too many people just focus on i am writing my book and i'm i'm, I'm in this kind of silo and all i'm doing is writing my book which is great but the challenge is if you don't also start sowing seeds you have to wait a lot longer for the harvest and you also have to wait a lot longer to to start practicing building up you know, the calluses that we talked about earlier. So I you know and, and and Lisa's great proof in in the fact that you know she didn't think oh I have to finish the course before I'm I can validate myself to actually start sending out a book. She started doing it during the process and I think that was amazing and it obviously resulted in you know incredible things happening for her as well. Yeah. She's um I I think she's someone who's at the beginning of her career we're going to see much more great stuff from Lisa in the future mm. as well. Mm. So yeah, she also it. started off as a blogger as well, didn't she, Mark? Which I mm. think is another good way to kind of build up those calluses and get some practice of interaction with an audience. Because a lot of people, again, in their silos, they don't tell even tell people they're writing a book. I think blogging is is a very overlooked, um, you know, benefit for people to even a way of doing your two hundred words a day in some ways. Yeah, and it's it's just getting into the habit of writing. That's the thing, getting into a habit of getting words words down and putting them out there. As you say, that's it, you know, we can we can write our two hundred words and no one ever gets to see them. But with blogging, it's out there in the public domain for all to see, which is that scary thing we talked about. But uh, and you'll get feedback on what works and what doesn't work, and you'll learn from that. Uh, but it's a good way to. Um, and you can control it as well, you know. So if someone does leave a snarky comment, you can just delete that. Yeah. So uh, absolutely, you know. no, it's good stuff. It's good stuff. Well, thank you so much, Lisa, for sharing us, uh, sharing with us your adventure, and we really look forward to uh, to seeing where your incredible career goes. It's just like Mark said, just the beginning. Um, and Mark, uh, social media this week, we've got. Um, I've been seeing quite a few wins on the academy this week, um, and. What, what's been going on? What have you been seeing at your end? Well, I'm going to be doing a NaNoWriMo special this week, okay, because we're recording this on December 1st. Um, <clears throat> so we've got all kinds of wins from uh, people in the Academy, people in uh, on social media, and uh, people in the BXP team. So let's let's do a quick social uh, NaNoWriMo special because it has been... Um, it, it, you know, it is the season to write 50,000 words. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so we've got some wins here. Uh, Fadzi Kasambira on the uh, Best Sell Experiment group on Facebook. I won NaNoWriMo on November 20th. 
Nice one, fancy. Wow. Uh, yay, and I'm coming to the end of my book, hoping to finish in the next few days, edit and send off to a special editor before submitting it to my agent in mid January. Uh, fancy, I've read Fancy's stuff before. Absolutely. If you like Harlan Coben, oh, Fancy is the new Harlan Coben. There's some great stuff there, really great twisty turny uh, stuff. Uh, Gavin Ralph, who writes as GB Ralph, um, and he's confirmed. 24 hours uh, later, because uh, he's been blogging and blogging and blogging, and actually do check out Gavin's blog. Uh, he says, I can confirm, still buzzed about winning NaNoWriMo. On the other hand, happy to be dialing back to the more humble 200 words a day target as per the Best Seller Experiments 200 word uh, challenge. 532 words so far with another drafting session planned later. Now, Gavin, I'm hoping to get Gavin on for a deep dive because Gavin has done extensive blogging about NaNoWriMo and various strategies and what he did to make that work. Uh, so I'm hoping to get a deep dive with Gavin. Gavin, maybe this side of Christmas might be in the new year, talking about what he did and how he achieved that. So uh, big congrats, Gavin, and hope to speak to you about that soon. Uh, we got uh, Gwen W, who is at Gwenulus on Twitter. Uh, NaNoWriMo finished. 50,784 words completed in November. Managed to write every day. A huge chunk of my novel project complete, albeit in a very first draft. What a week so far. And uh, 200 words a day at least. Bestseller experiment. So thank you, Gwen, and congrats on winning that. And Inkborn Blade on Twitter. Six-day streak so far. Uh, oh, this is post-Nano. This is post nano. So ink, ink, Inkborn Blade is uh, getting back into it now and starting to enjoy the words I'm getting down. Nothing groundbreaking, but steady progress. And again, looking at the daily word count, she's posted it on Twitter. Um, 226, 274, 238, 376, 345. It's all adding up, all fantastic stuff. Uh, and Jan Carr, uh, who's uh, on the Academy, uh, she did NaNoWriMo with less than three hours to go. Oh. Um didn't get around to registering on the site, more admin in it. So she made her own certificate and she's called it Jan's Novel Writing Month. <laughs> she's done a little certificate and everything. Jano Rhyme. Jano Oh, brilliant. <laughs> Do your own. Why not? Why the brilliant. hell not? <laughs> I love it. I love it. And on the Academy, we've had some amazing wins. With Denise is going all prep with her Jana, agent oh, hunting. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> So, Mark, it's time to announce the competition winners of the Back to Reality audiobook. Thank you to everyone who joined our mailing list to enter the competition. We're so grateful. And whoever's on this list, we have three winners that we've picked. And whoever's on this list will be receiving uh, an email uh, from one of us directly with uh, how to claim your audiobook online. And... Number one, we would like to congratulate Lou Gibbons. So, Lou, oh. if you are listening, congratulations. We also have Philip Rogers yes. and finally Jessica Kennedy. So, congratulations, Woo. Lou, Philip, and Jessica. You're the winners of our audiobook giveaway. And again, thank you to everyone for for uh, for entering. And um, we hope you enjoy your book. Yeah, you're in for such a treat. Kim Breton is the narrator, and she does such a fantastic job. It's such a wonderful... What takes takes our, our jumble of words and elevates it to the next level. Um, fantastic work from Kim, and congrats, Brilliant everyone. Brilliant stuff. Brilliant. So thank you, everyone, for joining us this week. We have got some really incredible interviews coming up in the next couple of weeks. Don't forget our Christmas special if you would like to... Let us know. Come on, come to the website, click on the contact us and send us a message. Tell us what your favourite Christmas book was as a kid or the best Christmas present you ever got. Uh, tell us about the nostalgic things that you loved about Christmas and your reading exploits. And uh, listen out as well. We've got, I mean, we've got so many guests coming in the new year, Mark, haven't we? Absolutely brilliant. We do apologise to everyone who's been contacting us to be guests, um, but do keep them coming. If you're... Um, you know, if you're representing, uh, you know, you've got an exciting story, something different, something a bit unusual, which will inspire our listeners, then drop us a note. And uh, Mark, if uh, if I can say as much, I would like to wish uh, you yourselves a very happy uh, Advent. And I hear there's birthday celebrations happening at some point over the month as well. So happy birthday to family yes, members and stay household. Yes. And, um, and to everyone out there <laughs> listening, if you have not started writing the 200 word challenge yet, you must start now. Get warmed up for 2022, folks. 200wordchallenge.com. Just go to the website, sign up. It's free. It will change your life and your word count. 
Definitely. If you want to drop us a line on social media, uh, we're on Facebook at Bestseller Experiment, Twitter and Instagram at Bestseller XP. And please, if you've enjoyed this episode, if you've got something from Lisa's wonderful uh, journey to publication and beyond, uh, do leave a, a rating or a review on your podcast uh, depository of choice. Absolutely. And don't forget, folks, 8th of December, 12 o'clock PST and 8 p.m. UK time. Join the two Marks, Mark and I, for a Bestseller Academy webinar. And if you'd like to sign up to the Bestseller Academy, early birds are closing soon, mid-December. After that, you'll just have to take your chances if there's any space left, folks. So do come along and join us. Um, We'd love to meet you. Find out what your goals are for 2022, and that's going to be the focus of the webinar. And if you missed the webinar, do come along anyway. You can register and watch the rerun and get inspired and maybe get some ideas for what your goals might want to be in 2022. So, Mr. Stay, it's a goodbye from Mark 1. And a goodbye from Mark 2. Goodbye! Goodbye!